to the 23rd Annual Energy Fair. My name is Nick Hyla, I'm the MREA Executive Director, and it is my pleasure uh, to introduce you to today's keynote speaker. Uh, I will not go through her bio, because you can all see it. It's on uh, page 14 of the program guide. Uh, I would like to say, though, that our experience with Leslie has been one that um, it's not as frequent as we would like that we find someone that has such an intriguing mind and such a big heart. And uh, Leslie uh, offered to do the keynote today and uh, for free, which is rare. So give her a big applause for that. And uh, sometimes the best things are free, and I'm sure you will find that with Leslie. So without further ado, Leslie Glustrom. We are good to go. Very good. Thank you so much for coming, everyone. We very much appreciate you being here. Uh, it is such an exciting thing, 23 years of this amazing fair. I think the most important thing to say about me is that I'm kind of nobody. I'm like you. I'm a mother who does not want my children's planet fried. And one of the main themes of the talk today is really about how each and every one of you can help us step up can help us to grow renewables to a much larger scale than they are, and that it's essential that each and every one of us do that, that we take that responsibility, that we do the sorts of things we're going to talk about today. Because as you've noticed, the folks we've elected to office are not really doing it, right? So it's really important that each one of us recognize that this is not about some major person or leader or president or anybody that's going to do this. This is about what you and I can do it. Is this, the, here we go. I wonder, is it perhaps running itself? That would be unfortunate. Let's hope it uh, decides not to run itself. <laughs> uh, so we need clean renewable energy to grow big. We need it to grow big for a number of reasons. We need it because the planet needs it. This is the kind of warming we've seen since the 1970s, even since the 1990s. I think we've all noticed that things have changed, that the climate is changing, that things are different than they used to be. We need to change because, I'm gonna see if I can stop this. I'm not sure why it's decided to. Uh, run itself. Let me give me give me a minute to, to try to regain control here. <laughs> okay. We need to make sure that renewable energy grows big because future generations need it and because other species need it. We can see where we're headed as we head if we think it's hot now and the weather is strange now, this is where we're headed for mid-century, this is where we're headed for late century, these are different scenarios, they're all terrible. Time is short, we have got to step up, we have got to move much faster than we have, and even if you don't believe one iota of the climate change or you've got an Uncle Harry or an Aunt Sally or whoever you've got that doesn't believe in climate change, we still need to repower with renewable energy and we need to do it really quickly. What you're looking at is a map of the coal plants in the United States. For reasons that we'll talk about more as we go down the road, we don't expect really any, very many of these coal plants to be operating in the year 2030. Something's got to replace them. That's got to be renewable energy. We have got to scale. Our elected officials are not in a position where they can do the work that needs to be done, so we must do it. We'll come back and talk a little bit more about this, but just to get you started, the colors of the, these dots are give you an indication of where the coal comes from. These coal plants rely on Appalachian coal. This is playing out very quickly. High sulfur coal in Illinois and Indiana. This is a kind of a question mark, but we don't expect it to power our country. Western low sulfur, high, high quality, high heat content coal. These mines are playing out quite quickly. 
For the last two decades, three decades, we've been lying largely on Powder River Basin coal from Wyoming and Montana. And you can see the very important role that that Powder River Basin coal is playing for Midwestern coal plants. There is not a big 200-year pile of coal sitting out there waiting to drop into the trains and show up at your coal plants. We have got to repower our country. We have got to do it quickly. Your state needs renewable energy to grow because right now you're burning billions of energy dollars pretty much every year in the Midwestern area. How absurd is it to be burning our energy dollars, spending them on coal and natural gas, when we could be investing those energy dollars in all the amazing things that you are seeing as you go around the fair here. So your state needs it, your community needs it, and this is really the scale that each and every one of you can work at. This happens to be the greenhouse gas inventory for Boulder, Colorado, where I presently live. I used to go to school here in Wisconsin, have a very deep love. I'm just thrilled to be back here, frankly. And you can see, this is every community bill is a little different, but the vast majority of any community's greenhouse gas emissions are going to come from their electricity use. This is, Colorado has, is reasonably far along in a development of renewable energy, and we have relatively lower carbon intensity electricity than most of the Midwestern states, and you can still see what a dominant role electricity is playing in Boulder's effort to meet our Kyoto goal, which we're nowhere near meeting. If we decarbonize our electricity, bingo, we pretty much get there pretty easily. We're working on that in Boulder, and you'll hear more about that story as we go forward. Here's very interesting. This is from the recent Yale climate, uh, poll on climate and clean energy. In case you haven't noticed, our country tends to be stuck in sort of a partisan paralysis. There's one energy that transcends, one issue that transcends all that. We have 96% of Democrats, about 96% of independents, and a mere 85% of Republicans who, when they are asked as individuals, not the folks that are going off to D.C. or Madison or wherever they're going, as individuals, 20% have believed there's a very high priority on clean energy, 31% a high priority, and 33% a medium priority. It's a mere 85% of Republicans. So go forth into your communities and be confident that Every once in a while, you're going to meet your aunt, whatever, you know, her name is, aunt, whatever, Bertha, or whatever, who just doesn't believe it, or Uncle George, or whatever. But the vast majority of you people you speak to understand this issue. They want to do something. They don't exactly know what to do. This is where you are here in the Midwest, along with U.S., and I apologize for those that can't see it. The PowerPoint will go online. You're always welcome to use the slides, whatever, we'll always work with you. We have a large team of people. Uh, black is coal. You can see that the Midwestern states here are dominated by coal. Red is nuclear. Illinois have very high percentage reliance on nuclear. Michigan, Minnesota, and Wisconsin, all a fair amount. A place like Indiana is almost all coal. Iowa is leading with renewable energy, the green, in terms of 16%. If you've been down in Iowa, you see a lot of wind farms. But they're trying to match, and that's fabulous, the little state that could, for sure. Second, uh, the state with the second most wind energy in our country. Cheer, three cheers for Iowa. They're trying to, woo! But they're trying to match it, in a sense, they're trying to put a veneer of wind over a coal-based system, and that's not likely to work in the long run. Coal is inflexible. We need flexible resources to match with increasing levels of renewable energy. I think now that we've got a few more people here, let's take just a minute to see where the audience is from. How many folks do we have here from Illinois? Woohoo! Let's give them a giant round of applause. Thank you for making the track. What about Indiana? Oh, yeah, check it out. A very coal-dependent state with a fabulous citizens' movement opposing their coal gasification plants. They have a very hard row to hoe. The Citizens Action Coalition and other groups in Indiana are doing fabulous work. Keep it up. You know, your time will come. You, too, will see that green bar grow. What about Iowa? How many folks do we have here from Iowa? Okay, yeah, thank you. Keep up the good work in Iowa. You'll 
we'll see some other good news from Iowa in a bit, but uh, this is something to be very proud of. Now you need to go after these coal plants and, and try to bring those down so you can build a more flexible grid. How many folks here from Michigan? Anybody here from Michigan yet? Yoo-hoo! Thank you. Way to make the trek. How about Minnesota? Yeah. Well done. And uh, Wisconsin. Anybody here from Wisconsin? <laughs> Very good. That graph that I just showed you, everybody's been doing great work. 23 years, Midwest Renewable Energy Association. You've got your state organizations. But the truth is, the results are pathetic. And each and every one of us is responsible for that. And each and every one of us needs to work as hard as we possibly can to change that. This is not 1972 or 1982 or 1992 or 2002. This is now 2012. And it's completely and totally unacceptable to have, for most of these states, less than 5% of your electricity coming from renewable energy. We thank the pioneers, the men and women who have showed us that wind works, that solar works, that solar thermal works, that we have all of these fabulous ways to both produce electricity without burning fossil fuels, to transport ourselves without burning fossil fuels. And now is the time to scale. And I spend a lot of time working on electricity because, again, it's the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions, and it's not very amenable to market solutions. You don't get to go to the grocery store and buy the kind of electricity you want, generally. You have to work through this terrible system we have. We've been satisfied with baby food. I love babies as much as the next person. But it's time to no longer be the smiling baby just so thrilled to get a few crumbs. It's time to demand each and every one of us to work with our communities, to work in our states, and to demand the real deal. I'm going to show you some places where it's happened, and I'm going to show you some ways that it can be done. This guy's doing a nice imitation. Again, a very cute guy. I don't know that you can see him. He's a little baby doing the, you know, the, the, the muscle man thing. Fabulous picture, three cheers to his parents, but it's time for us to no longer be satisfied with baby food, with, you know, pretend. It's time for us to get real. It's time for us to think big. It's time for us to flex our muscles. It's time for us to demand that we scale. It's time for the real deal, and anything below, at this point, anything below 30 or 40 percent renewable energy is not the real deal. We don't have a single state in this country that's getting the real deal. This is, this is just completely unacceptable, and those of you that are kind enough to care about this, unfortunately, you're going to be called on to lead those efforts in your community because it needs to be done, and we need citizens to stand up. We need you to start envisioning by 2030, where's the coal? The coal is gone. I just made this up, but I'm going to show you some real results too. We need to envision. <laughs> we need to envision getting rid of coal. It's the most carbon intensive thing. All that mercury, coal ash, water pollution, air pollution. What are we doing? I was in Africa not too long ago. They said, you're still using coal in the United States? I'm like, I'm very sorry to admit it. We're using a lot of coal. That means no more baby food. It means asking ourselves, how do we make renewable energy grow big? And we can wait for strong leadership from Washington, D.C. And guess what? We'll be waiting, right? We've been waiting for decades. Are we going to just sit back and continue to wait? Continue to fail as a country? continue to fail to address climate change, to continue to fail to repower our country for the 21st century? Or are we going to take leadership ourselves? And since you're all here, that's the right answer, right? <laughs> We've never done this before. None of us have a clue how to get this done. But there's some basic principles, and they've gone for every other major social change we've gone through, and they're not very difficult. And the good news they basically rely on, on people talking. And that's what people do well. So everyone in this audience and everyone you know can be part of this. Three basic steps, build inclusive teams, analyze the sticking points, and promote a better alternative. 
And guess what? When you've done all those things, you won't be done. So you need to go back to step one and start all over. And we need to keep doing this as long as we're physically and mentally capable because there's only one planet that supports life that we know of. And we also need to get our country repowered and quit burning our energy dollars. So build your team. Make sure that it's inclusive, inspiring, and interlocking. Do not reject somebody because they have pink hair. Do not reject somebody because they're too geeky or they don't know enough. Our team runs from, I was thinking about it, we are now have a four-year-old. <laughs> little Isla Parkin who not, belts out the anti-fracking song like you would not believe at the age of four. That song was written by her sister, Maya Parkin, who I think is about eight. We used to only have a five-year-old, now we go from four, and then our oldest person just turned 91. And we've got everything, uh, you know, we've got engineers and finance people and graphic artists and kindergarten teachers and you name it, we've got it. We want to make sure that everybody's involved, everybody's having fun. We feed people, you know, all the great stuff that you do here in the Midwest. Then we want to make sure those teams are interlocking. If you create a team in Portage, say, you want to make sure it's communicating with the team in Stevens Point and then they work at the state level and make sure that all those teams are interlocking. So when you turn the gears in, let's call it Portage, you're turning the gears everywhere. When we turn the gears in Boulder, we are getting international news and you too need to play this game with us. How did these folks do it? How did they abolish slavery? They didn't have, you know, they didn't have email or Twitter or anything of those things. They did an impossible thing. It took a long time. These are the Spencer brothers from Wisconsin, led by Jeff, who kind of got his other brothers. A little group of women abolitionists, including Susan B. Anthony, who both worked for Women to Get the Vote and Abolition of Slavery. This was a monumental and a seemingly impossible task. They achieved it. Suffragettes, the same story. Nameless, faceless people who put a priority on achieving the end they knew was critical. We take it for granted that women get to vote, they run for every office, um, but this was a long, this was a six decade process if you've read any of that. This is part of our team in Boulder, Colorado, you'll see them again. They, again, this happens to be our technical modeling team, so this happens to be a whole bunch of geeks. But, <laughs> as I say, we have little kids, and we have old folks, and we have all different walks of life going on and we'll talk a little bit about what this team and all of the people that they work with, this is one part of a huge team um, and we'll talk, but well, one of the things that I may, I think it was maybe on one of the last ones, when you build your team, remember to take a picture because it's one of the most powerful organizing tools you have, it's something I always forget, we've got a guy, Ken Regelson, who always says, take a picture, take a picture and it's just very helpful for people to see, this isn't like some fancy, these are just all of us who've decided to come together, combine our talents, combine our passion, donate whatever hard work we can, and insist on getting the job done. Before we move on, I want to ask this important question. Did these women fail? These are all women who worked for the vote, if you can't read the PowerPoint. Sojourner Truth died in 1883, Elizabeth Cady Stanton in 1902, and Susan B. Anthony in 1906. They spent their entire lives working for, to get women the vote, and they died long before it happened. So did they fail? No. Absolutely. And those of us that are not so young, we're going to live to see part of this transition. We're not going to live to see all of it. But you want to build your team so they're multi-generational. You want the 14-year-olds in 24 and 34 and on all the way, because this is going to take us a while. But we're here, we get to see the beginning, and we need to speed up the process. It's really critical that you get involved and that you do whatever you can and recognize that although some of us are going to die before the transition is complete, it's still really critical. You might think about the cathedrals in Europe, right? Cathedral of Rouen, over two centuries to build. You know, are they going to get, you know, after 50 years, they could say, oh, we've been trying so hard, you know, well, you're not done yet. Just keep going, stir and repeat. Get back on the horse. Once you've built your team, analyze the sticking points. Every state, every community is going to have different sticking points. You might have a governor who doesn't get it. <laughs> yeah. is not 
not a partisan issue, I'm not here to, but I will say there were an awful lot of us cheering you on. There were, there were signs in Boulder, Colorado that said, we call Scott Walker, hung on the bridges at, at, uh, at the rush hour. So, you know, when you win it, at first you don't succeed. Try, try again. Politics comes and goes. Do you think the abolitionists didn't have some troublesome governors? Do you think the suffragettes didn't have some troublesome senators? You know, politicians come and go. Movements just keep on going. And that's us, and we've got to do it. The one sticking point that's pretty much common to everywhere except for the Pacific Northwest, we're not there right now, there's a huge sticking point, and it's your coal plants. We're going to talk a little bit about that, talk about the economics. We're going to talk about why coal plants are really an anathema to high levels of renewable energy, because they don't allow large amounts of renewable energy to, to get incorporated. And that means that part of working for renewable energy is calling a spade a spade when it comes to coal plants. I'm going to give you some of the data. There's some handouts up here. We are absolutely available. You don't have to feel like, oh, I saw our talk or whatever. This is our work. We are citizens. We are here to help you. It's not just me. We have a huge team of folks in Boulder, Colorado, everywhere, and we will do whatever we can to help you analyze your situation. Once again, here in the Midwest, most of your coal... Hmm. Hmm. It says it's on, but it's not doing it. Anyways, most of your coal in the Midwest is coming out of Wyoming and out of Montana. Those all those red dots. And we're going to talk about what that means economically and what you might find um, as you look back to the source. How many people here have been to Wyoming and looked into the coal mines where your coal comes from? Oh, nicely done. If you haven't done that, I encourage you to do it. Uh, we're in the process of getting some videos made so you can do it the YouTube style. You can also do it on Google Earth. It's very important to understand that when you turn the electricity on outside of the grounds of MREA, where of course I think almost all the electricity is coming from the wind and the sun, but when you leave this, most of the electricity that's running your computers and your hair dryers and your refrigerators and your air conditioners and everything else, most of it originates with the coal in the Powder River Basin. I've brought some coal with me. Coal is actually fascinating stuff. I'd love to leave some of it for future generations. You can almost see the trees and the ferns. Why do we want to burn it all in one generation? Good question. This is one of the reasons that uh, renewable energy is being held back, is because we've got all of this money. This is the cost curve. This is what it'll cost to operate our new coal plant that unfortunately Excel moved ahead with in Colorado. By the time we get into the 2020s and the 2030s, We'll be spending, every couple years, we'll be spending a billion dollars to operate that thing. This assumes coal's costs go up 10% a year. They may not go up that fast. But the important point is, is that even after you've built a coal plant, you've got to operate it. And it is not cheap, despite the endless commercials and the endless sort of brainwashing we've had that coal is cheap. Here's what's going on for Wisconsin. I want to thank Union of Concerned Scientists. Is Barbara Fries in the audience? By uh, Barbara's a fabulous woman who's done great work on coal. They wrote a great report, Burning Coal, Burning Cash. You'll see quite a few um, uh, graphics from that. And uh, you can see what's happening with Wisconsin. In 2008, $853 million was sent out of your state to pay for coal. Now, what do you suppose you could do if you used $850 million on wind and solar and electric vehicles and charging stations and all that? Can you get there? So it's the coal plants that are, I often think of a refrigerator and down in the corner is the little baby food and that's what we're supposed to eat. And all the other stuff in the refrigerator, that's what the coal plants and the fossil fuel infrastructure, they get to eat all that other stuff. And we gotta quit being happy with it. We gotta be like the little baby who goes, hey, I don't want any more baby food. I want the real deal. I want hundreds of millions of dollars spent investing on the infrastructure for the future. We'll talk about how we can analyze that. This is what's going on with uh, Wisconsin's coal costs. And uh, it's funny, when I lay it down, it works. It works. Does it, is it working? Okay, there we go. Back into 2004 is an inflection point. Before this time, 
U.S. coal came in around $1.20 a million BTU, depending on the state and the length of transportation. 2004, coal costs started going up. As it turns out, coal is this thing called non-renewable. And when you mine it and you put it in trains, and you do that day after day, month after month, week after week, pretty soon, you know, the easily accessible stuff becomes hard to reach. And that time actually sort of started to become more apparent in 2004. You can see, despite what does or doesn't happen to the economy, Wisconsin's coal costs have doubled, more than doubled, in the last seven years. Oh yeah, that's great news. The problem is almost no one knows it. So I've got some handouts for each of the six states we've talked about of your coal costs. Uh, there's two states, so if you don't see your state, flip it over and look for the one. I encourage you to come up and get this. Sorry, I don't mean to flash here. Um, they come up and get it. I put them in plastic sleeves and carry them in my briefcase, and I show them to people. And when they see this, they go, wow. And that's the beginning of getting people to think about what it means to have renewable energy scale. So we need your help passing that word. Lots of those handouts up here. We've done the analysis for every state that uses coal. It's here, plus the most recent coal costs for the last couple. When I looked at coal costs for the last, I think it was March of this year, I broke into a cold sweat. They were so much higher than I expected to be. I was just like, oh my goodness. Let's talk a little bit about the fundamentals, about why that's happening. Again, we need your help kind of carrying this message. Coal is not cheap, it is not abundant, and when it doesn't show up at power plants, it is not reliable, and we don't have millions of dollars to run ads on all the baseball games and on CNN and all the places you might be seeing clean coal ads. So what we have is you and your help to carry this message and our willingness to basically show up wherever you'll invite us to <laughs> and uh, to help carry this message. So this is a, a relatively simplistic version of the Powder River Basin where about 40% of our country's coal comes from. There's about 12 mines over here on the eastern edge. When those mines were opened up in the 1980s and we basically played the Wyoming coal card in order to fuel our country for the last uh, now three decades, when they opened up those mines, they scraped off 50, 100, 200 feet of dirt and then had 80 and 90 foot coal seams dumped them into trains, and powered everything that you see in Iowa, Minnesota, Michigan, and on and on and on. As those mines expand, we're going to soon see that these mines typically have less than a 10-year lifespan. 10 is not 200, just in case you haven't noticed. As they expand from east to west, they'll be going down the sides of this bowl, and the coal at the bottom of the bowl is down well over 1,000, and some of it's down below 2,000 feet. And when the United States Geological Survey analyzed the coal in the Powder River Basin, all of these areas that are, if you can see it, all of this, it's in a blue hatching. That coal is not expected to be surface mineable. I predict that very little of that coal will ever be mined. So instead of having 200 years of coal, we actually have some very small fraction of accessibly, economically accessible coal this is a, something I've written about in Coal Cheap and Abundant, or is it uh, something like that, is a report that's on Clean Energy Action's website. Um, I'm happy to work with anybody that's interested in the story offline, and I'll walk you through all of this. This is what we do. But let's just take a quick look. Let's look at the Black Thunder Mine. This is the largest coal mine in the country, over 100 million tons of coal a year, almost about 10% of our country's coal. Its remaining lifespan is about 10 years, about seven years. That should really give you pause. The country's largest coal mine has less than 10 years left on it. It's going in for an expansion that would add about 10 years, but that coal in the expansion area will be buried much more deeply, over 400 feet deep, than the coal that we're presently mining on average. Again, this is fabulously good news. If somebody gives me a million or 10 million or 100 million, I'll run ads. Believe me, we will let the country know. Until that time, we need your help. The fundamental data is up here. This is now the second largest coal mine, North Antelope Rochelle. Its remaining life is about eight years, going in for an expansion. And again, the coal in the expansion area will be buried much more deeply. That means it'll be much more expensive. So let's see what's already happening to coal costs around the country. 
Here's Minnesota's coal costs going up about 9% a year, a little below $2 a million BTU. From data that we've gotten in Colorado, I'm pretty confident that once you get above $1.50 a million BTU, you should no longer assume that coal is the cheapest way to produce electricity. And that's without, that assumes the planet has no value, that assumes human health has no value, this is no cost on carbon, no externality charge, all the things we should be doing when we analyze this. Putting all of that aside, once you're above about $1.50 million BTU, you should be asking, is coal really the cheapest way? And the answer is probably, you know, every state's going to be different. But it's time to start asking that question. Here's Michigan. Coal costs going up about 10% a year. That means they're going to double in, you know, seven years, give or take. Well, at, well above, you know, way up at around $2.81 a million BTU. I checked all these costs for 2012, and they've all gone up except for Georgia, which has come down a little. But every other state, they've continued to go up for the first couple months of 2012. Iowa, somebody's awake in Iowa. <laughs> I don't know who it is, but they pay less for their coal in Iowa than they do in Nebraska. Now, those trains have come across Nebraska, dumped off a bunch of coal, and come to Iowa. When they dump it off in Iowa, it's cheaper than in Nebraska. So whoever is paying attention to coal costs in Iowa, again, you know, kudos to Iowa, but really you should just get off of coal, build a flexible system. Here's Indiana. Indiana loves coal. They used to be paying $1.21 just, you know, eight, seven, eight years ago. Now they're paying close to $2.50 a million BTU, more than double during this period. When they wake up in Indiana, um, they'll realize that coal is really not the key to the future in Indiana either. That's politically, you think it's hard in Wisconsin, try just going to Indiana. Kudos to the folks from Indiana who've come all the way here. Illinois, going up 8% a year, about $2 a million BTU, last time we could check it. Let's take a look at New York. Oh. <laughs> Guess what happens when you have coal at $4 a million BTU? Your coal plants go bankrupt. I don't wish any ill will on any of the folks that work in coal plants. These are all very good people who have provided us electricity for decades. We all owe them a great debt of gratitude. But it is time to move beyond coal. The economics are moving in our way. AES Eastern tried to sell its remaining. It bought them in the late 90s. Six coal plants, four kind of quit operating because it realized, oops, those weren't a good idea. They had two, the Somerset and the Cayuga. They realized these were no longer economic. They spent last year trying to sell them. And they couldn't. Woohoo! So they've just filed for bankruptcy. And as we think about this, these are the coal plant retirements. Um, this was late last year. I wasn't able to find an update that's probably out there. I just wasn't able to find it. If we were to redo this, add another six months, there would be more dots here of coal plants retired. We would see these bankruptcy of the coal plants in New York. But you know, this is not some sort of contagion that just stays kind of in the Appalachian area. Um, this is something that's likely to start coming your way. This is why it's very, very important that we scale renewables because it's, we've got to keep the lights on in the United States. And having less than 5% of your electricity come from renewables is not going to do it in Chicago and Indianapolis and Cincinnati and Detroit and everywhere else. We have got to repower. We've got to think big. We have got to step up. We are the people that understand it. We have got to lead the way because our elected folks are not doing it. This is, again, we're going to expect to see that kind of uneconomic nature of coal just keep coming and moving more into the Midwest as well as into these states. I've been in most of these states, have worked with Utilities Commission and citizens in most of these states, but again, understanding the problem and fixing the problem are two different things. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Before we do that, I want to just give you a feel for this magnitude of what's going on. These are all 2008 numbers, and your coal costs have gone up a lot. So in Michigan, it was 1.36 billion on coal in 2008. Add about 20% to that now. Just going up a smokestack, literally, right? Should be invested in all these great technologies. Indiana, 1.29 billion. Illinois, 1.49 billion. Wisconsin, a little less than a billion in 2008. You're probably above a billion now. 
Minnesota about half of a billion. So what this means, Iowa again about half of a billion, and all of these have gone up. What that means is that when you've got a system like this, you're burning your energy dollars in a really big way. We've got to stop doing that. Money is not actually, you know, renewable. <laughs> so we've got to be much more careful about how we make these investments. No more baby food. Start envisioning the real thing. And after you've built your team and analyzed the sticking points, it's really important that those of us that understand this, that have had the opportunity to come to the Midwest Renewable Energy Fair, that we really start to envision an entirely different system and that we advocate for it beginning in our communities. It's fabulous to change your own personal life to get solar systems when you can, electric vehicles, do everything you can in your life. But it's not nearly enough. We have got to transform our entire society and trying to do that in Washington, D.C., I think you probably understand is impossible. Every time a senator leaves a hearing, so I've been there quite a bit, you know, somewhere between five and ten fossil fuel lobbyists just trail them all the way to the elevator. Mr. Senator, Mr. Senator, Mr. Senator, you know, the world will come to an end if you don't continue our fossil fuel subsidies. And, of course, they have the money to be able to do it, just like we've seen what money does in Wisconsin and elsewhere. Not going to happen at the national level. State level is important, but most of us can't work at the state level because we don't live in Madison or, you know, wherever. So the way to really do it, I believe, is to start at your community level because we all live in communities, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. But let's talk, what are the options? How are we going to think about growing renewable energy? Well, we can work with your utility, we can work with your community, or you can just kind of do the whole visionary thing. I want to walk you through each of those kind of quickly. If you're going to work with your utility, I've spent most of the last decade of my life, I resigned my job in 2004 with the support of my amazing husband, said, yeah, okay, we got two kids in college, but we know climate change is real, so I'll just grade endless papers. He's a teacher. I'll grade endless papers so that you can do that. So I've spent the best part of a decade trying to work with my utility. I intervene at the Utilities Commission in Colorado. Uh, my office is filled with Utilities Commission documents. I've, if you go on the internet, you'll see all this testimony and exhibits and yada yada. And after close to a decade, I have almost nothing to show for it. So I want to warn you that that may not be the fastest and best way to get this job done. But if perchance you should go to your utility, you build your team, you get your four-year-olds and your 90-year-olds and everybody in between, and you go to your utility and say, we are ready for renewable energy, you need to give it to us, we know it can be done, we don't buy any of your arguments because they're all false, we demand it. And if your utility says, you know, you're absolutely right, we are on board for building a 21st century utility, we're going to make it a low carbon utility, we understand that it needs to be distributed instead of centralized the way we have been, we understand that it needs to be flexible in order to support large amounts of renewable energy, we understand that it should be ethical, we shouldn't be getting our natural gas from fields where people then can then light their taps on fire in order to, to produce the natural gas. We should have um, an ethical utility that gives some thought to where the, all of this stuff comes from. And that goes for how the solar panels are made and everything else, right? Enough of this cheap electricity that's just destroying the planet and human health and everything else. It should be ethical, and, and we as a utility are committed to do all of that by 2030 or earlier because we really get that this is a crisis and it's urgent. And if your utility says all of those things to you and gives you a real plan and demonstrates that they're really going to do it, please let me know. So, <laughs> so I, can, I can incorporate it as we go around talking about this. But chances are, if you try to work with utility, this is what you're going to get. Crumbs. That's why we have less than 5% renewables in most of the Midwestern states. And places like Colorado that are supposed to be a leader, we have a grand total of 12% on XL system and less than that on every other, all the other utilities. This is pathetic. It's got to change. We've got to quit being satisfied with baby food, quit being satisfied with crumbs, and we've got to look for a much sweeter deal. As you can see, I think working with your community, wherever you live, you live in a community, there are people around you, you may not know them yet. You've got to draw them out of their living rooms where they're swearing at their TV or speaking to the shower head about, you know, we would get some more clean energy or whatever. You got to draw them out and feed them and engage them and build a team. 
Build your team, analyze your electric supply, are you, are you with an investor owned or with your rural electric, whatever it is. Advocate for lower carbon solutions. And again, you know what? You're not gonna succeed completely, so then you go right back to step one and do it all over again. This again is our team. I'd like to point out a couple people. Alison Burchell is the visionary who understood a decade ago that we really weren't gonna get there by working with the utility. She waited for me to figure it out after about seven years. Um, this is Sam Weaver, who's been one of our main spokespeople, but the big person I really want to point out is Tom Asprey. He hates speaking in public. He's an absolute brain, and a lot of this analysis you're going to see is stuff that Tom did for us. He retired early from Hewlett Packard, and then he's done work for us in the last year that's worth at least $100,000. You're going to see just a few of the results. We said, okay, XL, you're all about your coal. We are not about your coal. Should we as a community decide to create our own municipal utility that, guess what, would emphasize this thing, the sun, and this, the wind turbine. And, uh, but before we did it, because this was a tough campaign, not as tough as what you went through in Wisconsin, but we were up against a million dollars in a municipal election. That's a lot of money in one town. Every time you turned on the computer, there were ads. Every time you turned on the TV, there were ads. Every time you turned on the radio, there were ads. Before we did it, we wanted to be sure that we could actually come up with something that was better. This is sort of the summary in terms of where Excel is headed. You can see coal out to 2030, and it's not like then it goes away. Excel's plan is coal out to 2069 for us, then natural gas on top, and then what I call this veneer of renewables. And you don't see the green getting bigger, you see it stalled out. Excel has acknowledged this in their testimony at the commission. And they're like, we're done. We've met all the laws. Colorado is one of the toughest laws. We've met it and we're done. And guess what? That's not okay. So Tom, the brilliant guy, built this model. Usually only utilities get the model. And it costs $100,000 to get it. And Tom said, well, I'll just build one. So he did and we vetted it in a dozen ways. And he's run hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of modeling runs. And the really cool news is that model is available to you. We changed the data. I'll tell Tom and the modeling team, they'll be very grateful. Uh, we changed the data for your solar data, your wind data, your coal data, and on and on and on. And we give you some sense of, could you greatly decarbonize your electricity supply? And this assumes that with Excel's 2011 rates, you don't see any coal here. We see in the neighborhood of 40, moving up towards 50 and 60% renewables, supported by natural gas. We are not big fans of natural gas, but you're going to have natural gas with whichever system you get until we build better storage mechanisms. We fully believe that by the time we get towards 2020 and beyond, Excel's rates will have gone up, which means we may get more renewables. There will be better storage mechanisms, and that will allow us to do more renewables. So this is using very conservative assumptions. We assumed our municipal bonds were going to cost us 8%. Municipal bonds aren't likely to cost you that. Uh, so this is a very conservative model, but you can still see we've completely eliminated coal, and our goal is to be as close to fossil fuel free by 2030. We can't model it yet because we don't know exactly what those technologies will be or what they'll cost, but we have every intention in Boulder to drive towards a very high level of renewables, as close to 100% as we can get. And we're going to get there. You know, we got to fight a huge legal battle first, but we're pretty sure we're going to win ultimately after they make us pay, you know, millions and millions of dollars. And we are determined. But it only matters if our example inspires you. Because Boulder's 230 megawatt load. Okay, so if we get to 100% renewables, big deal. But if it inspires you to try to do this in your community, then it starts to become a much bigger deal. And it shouldn't be that hard. This is the cost data we have from Excel. If, if this was a market-based system, we could go to the grocery store and say, well, I could buy some really dirty black coal electrons for $50 a megawatt hour, five cents a kilowatt hour, or I could get some nice clean wind electrons with the production tax credit in place and only pay $35 a megawatt hour. And if this was a grocery store thing, this stuff would fly off the shelves. But it's not a grocery store thing, it's a regulated monopoly thing. That's where we're here to help you as you work through all of this. We have people that have experience with just about everything you're gonna run up to, so don't be shy about being in touch. 
One of the things that we've learned that our utility does, I just want to point this out because we probably have some kind of geeky types out there. I want to just mention this to you. We found out that when Excel analyzes coal versus wind or fossil fuels versus renewables, they take future fuel costs and they discount them at 7.6%. So that fuel costs that we would experience 30 years from now are showing up as nine cents on the dollar. Oh, that's not what we're gonna pay, right? But it's, I think it's probably a holdover from when they didn't really have renewables and renewables weren't real and they just discounted everything, capital costs. And, and, it, and so um, when you get this far, just check. Chan, there's a good chance your utility is discounting those future fuel costs. In a sense, making fuel costs kind of for fossil fuel system look like they're going to be zero or close to zero. Well, that's clearly not the case. So they're going to be in the billions. They shouldn't be discounted. At, and if you want to talk to me, come up afterwards. I'd, I'd be happy to work with anybody that wants to work this. The other thing I'd like to show you just briefly is why coal and other base load, meaning nuclear, is really not the right solution. And um, this is, again, out of our citizens' modeling. This model is available to you. This is Boulder's load. You can see the summer peak. You can kind of see a little, little kind of sub-peak in the winter months. This is going from January to December. And you see the shoulder months. And in the old way you would plan a utility, you would build a base load coal plant because your load never goes below this amount. Then you finish it off with natural gas. And that's how you build a utility. That's sole last century. If you then, so anybody says, they say, oh, utilities go, what are you going to do for base load? And what you should tell them is, we don't want your base load. Because base load is like a code word for coal or nuclear. Base load is inflexible. It's an absolute, base load is to utilities in the 21st century what typewriters are to newspapers. Completely and totally unnecessary and obsolete. When you add, for example, 30% renewables, the wind blows and the sun shines all the times that the wind blows and the sun shines, you take your load and you subtract what's being produced by the wind in the spring and the fall, subtract what's being produced by the sun in the summer, and all of a sudden, all of this area in here are hours of the year when your system with 30% renewables is clashing with your base load. And we've been able to do discovery at the Colorado Commission and we found out that, yep, this absolutely happens. And you know what happens when this happens? Because coal plants can't be turned on and off and the same with nuclear plants. It takes two or three days to cool them down and da 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 So when these kinds of times happen, we're only at about 12% renewables. We have the data for that from Colorado. But what the utility does is they call up the wind farm and they say, shut your wind turbines down because we can't shut our coal plants down. And uh, they pay millions of dollars to the wind farms to do that. This is beyond absurd. It's time to move beyond base load. Again, this is a concept that we'd love to work with. This kind of intrigues you what I'm talking about. Feel free to be in touch. We'd love to, you know, kind of go deeper with you on that. It's an outmoded concept from the last century, so don't let them use it like a cudgel, which is what they try to do. 21st century utilities need to be flexible to support high levels of renewable energy. Everybody knows that the sun, you know, shines and it goes away and the wind blows and it goes away. That's all fine. Every form of generation is, is variable. We just had our huge coal plant in Colorado just go down. Boom. I've heard through the grapevine that one of their cooling fans went out and boom, we lost 750 megawatts. That's also a variable resource and not very predictable, frankly. Whereas wind and sun are pretty darn predictable. So, and what we need is a flexible system to support them. I'd like to take the last few minutes that we have to talk a little bit about kind of what this means to envision a better system. And uh, then we'll, you know, for those that are going to a two o'clock uh, workshop, we'll, we'll let you know about five minutes before that. And I'll stay and answer questions as long as people would like. Let's look a little bit at the US wind resource. This is the whole nation, and it's actually a little outdated, so let's kind of just very quickly look at the states. Illinois, 2,700 megawatts of wind installed. They should be very proud of that. That's good, but it's less than, uh, it's almost, it's a little, it's almost one one hundredth of the potential in Illinois. Just so you know, as we go through these maps, the blue counties have wind installations in them. The green circles are manufacturing facilities. 
All of this is available from the American Wind Energy Association. My PowerPoint will be available. These are very important slides for you to show in your community to help people understand that yes, we've, we've come a long way, we have so much farther to go. We're going to do this quickly. Indiana, about 1,300 megawatts of wind, fabulous work, that's a great start. It's still less than one one hundredth of the potential in Indiana. Iowa, 4,000 again, you know, top state next to Texas for wind installations, the lower 4,000 megawatts. One, less than one one hundredth of the 570,000 megawatts of potential. Minnesota, 2,733 megawatts, well done. Again, way less than one one hundredth of the potential in Minnesota. We've, we've done great. There's no shortage of, of headroom to get better. Wisconsin, we all know Wisconsin's been struggling for reasons I'm just not going to go there. <laughs> Um, both political and all the regular, you know, the siting regulations, all of that stuff. But Wisconsin also has really very nice wind potential, and you two will, will catch up and prevail. I want to be clear, I think most of you know this, but this is not a technological problem. As soon as you open the market for wind and solar, do not worry. The developers will show up just in a flood. This is results from 2009, April of 2009, our economy was seized up. You couldn't want to say you couldn't finance a fishing boat in April of 2009. And all of these responders to an, an RFP from Excel had to show that they could, they could finance their wind farm or their solar uh, installation. Excel was asking for about 1,000 megawatts. We got over 15,000 megawatts of responses. I sweated this RFP out because I thought, <gasps> They're going to ask for 1,000 and only get, you know, 600 megawatts of response. We got 15 times what we asked for. They ran another RFP in early 2011. They asked for 200 megawatts of wind, and they got 6,000 megawatts of response. When you do the work to demand renewable energy, do not worry. The industry will make it show up. There is no doubt. Take a quick look at the solar resource. And, uh, you know, obviously I live where there's an awful lot of sunshine. You live where there's a little less sunshine. But I want you to also pay attention to Alaska, because we're about to talk about a, a country that has the solar resource of Alaska, and a lot of you know that's Germany, right? What's going on in Germany? Well, let's start. Sorry, I forgot about this. Here's where we are in the United States. Cumulative installed solar. This is fabulous. I've seen some great installations here in Wisconsin. Beautiful one just north of Wild Rose on 22. A farmer has put up this ground mountain, that ground mountain, this ground mountain. Really great stuff. Good stuff in Madison, I saw. Very exciting to see this progress. But pay attention, we're just a little bit above 2,000 megawatts or 2 gigawatts for the entire United States. Germany, solar resource of Alaska, just at the end of last month, in the middle of the day, it was producing 22,000 megawatts of solar electricity. Solar resource of Alaska, you know, the sun came out and they got 26 gigawatts installed and they got 22,000 megawatts of solar production. If they can do it in Germany, I think we can do it in Wisconsin and Michigan and everywhere else. Uh, and all my slides have um, the source of the information, so when you get the slideshow, you can always go check all this out yourself. Let's take a look at a place in North America that is a very important example, and that's Ontario. And yeah, are you from Ontario? Woohoo! Well done. Short, long story short, in 2007, Ontario did a study. They obviously have this thing called government sponsored healthcare in Canada. And they did a study of the coal plants and tried to figure out what the costs were, the health costs were. And they said, boy, these cheap coal plants over here are causing this really expensive health costs over here, and it's all coming out of the same government pot, so we're just going to shut down our coal plants. Yeah. They're not quite done yet, but remember, that was just 2007. We're only five years in. Um, in a minute, we'll see a little bit more about them. Uh, they thought they were going to build nuclear, uh, and they really got the price tag on nuclear, and they said no. So this is where they are. You can go to the Ontario Power Authority, you follow their reports, especially here in the Midwest. If I want to get people from Colorado to Toronto, it's going to cost me 800 bucks. 
I really want to fly some legislators there, and that's a pretty steep price tag. Y'all can get in your cars or whatever and just go. Go, take pictures, bring back the stories. This is from north of here. Don't let anybody complain about, oh, we don't have very much sun. Uh, you got a lot more than Ontario. So <laughs> they're up around 32% renewable energy. That renewable energy includes a significant amount of hydro. But what I'd like to do is focus on the solar. This is cumulative installed photovoltaic capacity. And we can see California over here, a little over 1,000 megawatts. My state, Colorado, we're considered a leader. We have a grand total of 100 megawatts. Remember, Germany has 26,000 megawatts. But everybody looks at us as a leader. We're stalled out. Excel is invested in coal plants, and we're stalled out. These are the top five states. All the Midwestern states are way, 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 way down here. You're well under 50 megawatts each in each of your states. Good start. Time to get big. Ontario in service has about three times as much solar as Colorado. And in process, as a result of their feed-in tariff programs, they have 1,500 megawatts coming online in the next year or two. Don't let anybody tell you it can't be done. It absolutely can be done. You've got to get the policy right. You've got to demand it. Uh, go to Ottawa. Go to Toronto. Understand it. Bring that news back and use your states as a way to drive our country. We've got this fundamental question, are we going to continue to burn our energy dollars, or are we going to invest them? Your mission, build your teams, analyze your sticking points, advocate for a better solution, and do it all over again. Because this is not easy, it's going to take hard work. This is not about, oh, I tried and it didn't work, you know. I try to include this picture with the Midwest folks. Um, Lots of cows, you're going to have days when you're really discouraged, days when you feel like you don't have a friend anywhere, there's a lot of cows. And every time you see a cow, just, you know, keep on chewing. Just keep on keeping on. And that's really the only way social change happens. Important things take time. It's very important to smile through this process. We are at the beginning of the solar era, and we are really, really lucky to live this time. We are going to prevail, there is no doubt. We don't know how long it's gonna take, but time is of the essence, so we're gonna work really hard. But whether we live to see it or not, we are definitely gonna prevail. But it's important, no more baby food, no more crumbs, think big, and it's time to demand the real deal, and it's up to you and me and all the other mothers and fathers and kids and everybody else to get this job done. I wanna thank you so very much for your time.